Okay, um, some of the advantages of replacement over other efforts in the longevity space. One is we don't have to understand the thousands of things, tens of thousands of things going wrong as we age. Right? If you're going to replace things wholesale, old tissues, old organs, old, old body with young body, uh, you fix all those problems all at once. Uh, another advantage is um, you don't really need biomarkers, right? And no one's going to say that a 18-year-old uh, body is not young compared to an 80-year-old body, right? I mean, biomarkers can still be helpful, but you don't really need them. Um, another advantage, you know, FDA approval for treating aging, another big concern. You know, that would be great. But again, for replacement, they're already on board. Like, you know, you can get... They're allowing pig organs to be put into human people to extend life, their lifespan and um, not to beat aging yet because you need wholesale replacement. But uh, they're pretty much on board uh, with replacement, including for um, therapies, uh, cell replacements for the brain. Um, so there's not much convincing there. And, um, and they're willing to fund this. And governments around the world are wi willing to fund this. So that also was something I wanted to bring up to, I saw, oh, yep, Micah's in the back there, but, you know, government funding was sort of at the apex of the, uh, of the focus there, and governments are willing to fund this already uh, for replacement, so another advantage. Um, oh, are we good? Oh, that's okay, I'll take whatever you got. <laughs> it wouldn't hurt me if I could see the next slides coming anyway. Uh, what other advantages? Anybody? Uh, any other advantages you can think of? Um, oh, the cost. Yeah. So thanks to uh, Mark at the uh, Longevity Biotech Fellowship for doing a, a really wide survey of scientists uh, to figure out costs of um, replacement to beat aging. And, uh, you know, for it's much lower than the alternative of trying to address all the different things that go wrong again. So, yeah, so since I'm, I started with that, I, let me just jump to, to that slide. Yeah, so am I missing any that I forgot? Uh, yeah, there's already a lot of interest among the scientific community in regenerative medicine. Um, it's just we don't have the funding to recruit them on our specific projects, but they're, they're already very interested. Uh, yeah, oh yeah, well, high probability of success is probably the most, uh, meaningful one. Okay, so aging. So some of you may recognize this person, uh, famous actor and director Clint Eastwood. Uh, this is what he looks like more recently. So, you know, what are we looking at here between, you know, the young Clint Eastwood and the old Clint Eastwood? It's really the accumulation of uh, this different forms of damage that occur over time. This damage is very complex. Um, it's, it's also uh, stochastic in nature uh, as, as to how it uh, you know, hits different uh, molecules in our body. Um, there, it's somewhat stochastic. But most importantly, it's non-enzymatic. Right? So it's not a part of a biological process that's reversible with any gene uh, that's encoded in our genome. We don't have any genes that recognize this damage or can reverse it. Um, and so uh, that means it's more of a physical process with time. So our bodies just, you know, the lo especially the long-lived proteins outside our cells that don't turn over normally, uh, they just accumulate damage over time. And, you know, this is what you get. Uh, and um, so uh, it's really hard to address with any approach uh, other than replacement. Um, and, and we know that it's a lot of what's outside of cells that matters to aging because the experiment's been done. So it, it, there's many studies where they take uh, from young tissue, they take the young cells, and they put it in old tissue, and those cells behave like old cells. Right? And vice versa, if you take old cells from old tissue and you put them in young tissue, 
they behave like young cells. So it's worth pointing out that these, um, these young cells that you take from young tissue and behave like their old cells, they have young telomeres, young mitochondria, young epigenomes, you know, a lot of the areas of interest in longevity. But they're going to have a limited impact. They may boost performance to some extent, and so they may be worth uh, exploring for that reason. But you know, if ever we want to really significantly uh, extend uh, lifespan, uh, replacing cells themselves is not going to be enough. So it really is going to take a tissue level replacement. OK, so does this make any sense for the brain, right? We can't replace the brain. It's who we are, a long-term memories, personality. Um, and so there are two reasons why um, it makes sense to think about progressive brain tissue replacement without losing one's self-identity or function. One is that we can add to the brain, uh, or at least all the evidence points to that fact that you can add to the brain, new cells that integrate with the rest of the brain. Um, so you know, this is one sort of standout paper from almost 10 years ago already. It wasn't the first one, but it was sort of the first nice one to describe how well new neurons can integrate with the adult brain. Um, so since then, there's been like you know, dozens of labs maybe that have reproduced this, including ours, uh, showing that if you put in young precursors, usually neocortical precursors, into the adult brain, uh, they do really well in terms of connecting with the rest of the brain. Um, so I just highlighted, you know, some of the integrate functionally, integrate efficiently, you know, everybody's saying the same thing. Uh, those neurons differentiate and integrate with the rest of the brain. But um, the problem isn't solved by doing this. One, you also have to remove the old tissue, but also what's being put in here is really not functional, despite the use of functional and repair is very, used very loosely uh, in the literature to sell these findings. Um, the, 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 what's put in is, not, is missing a lot of aspects, and I'll get into that in a second to, to really be functional. Uh, but it's something we're working on. So the other part of the equation, right, is to remove old tissue. If you don't do that, uh, you know, the aging vessels will inevitably lead to stroke uh, or, or ischemic or, or uh, um, otherwise uh, leakage of blood. Um, so you, you have to remove the old tissue as well. It's just falling apart. Um, and why do we think this is possible? Well, because it's uh, that it's been shown to happen in the clinic already, uh, in humans of advanced age. So um, occasionally, individuals have a benign tumor that takes a while to grow. And sometimes it's in the language center. Sometimes it's in the personality center. Sorry. Uh, and um, during that time, these individuals do not lose those functions. So they continue to speak normally. No one notices any, different, they, any difference. They don't notice any difference. Um, if it's in their personality, they behave the same. And why is that? That's because of the uh, incredible plasticity with which the neocortex encodes information. So if you give it enough time, um, even when you remove the area like the language center in these patients, they, they can still speak perfectly fine because they were continuously using that function while that part of their brain was being destroyed by the tumor. This is very different than if you have a stroke of the same size and the same aged individuals in this area, then you lose the ability to speak and you don't regain it. But as long as the damage is slow from a pinpoint out and you're using those functions, it gets re-encoded. So you can remove tissue without loss of function or self-identity. Right? So that's the other half of the equation. Uh, and this is just a uh, cartoon of how that would be implemented. I'm going to tell you, um, well, first, you know, young brain, it loses volume as you get old. Uh, and so that in itself creates space for new young tissue. This tissue, as I'll show you in a bit, is um, a tissue that has to be very immature in order for it to integrate with the adult brain. Uh, and that's, that's what we're designing. And so after grafting that, we can mimic what the tumors do without using a tumor 
to um, silence other parts of the neocortex so that they're no longer being used for anything while the information gets re-encoded elsewhere. As long as the individuals are using what's encoded in there, it will get re-encoded elsewhere. Uh, and then we can remove it without loss of anything and add new tissue and repeat the process. And you can go from an old brain to a young brain. Okay. So combined with replacement for other parts of the body, we could actually beat aging. Not everybody wants to beat aging, though. I do, but you know, a lot of people just want to live healthier for a little longer, uh, or you know, healthy until uh, they all of a sudden fall apart at around 90 and 100. Um, so, if that's your goal, I think what we're doing is still relevant. Um, permanent brain damage costs the world like trillions of dollars in in lost e economic. Um, um, aspects, and that's from stroke, trauma, and largely um, Alzheimer's and related dementias. So it's a big cost, and again, governments are willing to pay to fix this problem. The NIH spends a lot of money on Alzheimer's, a lot. I mean, it's all relative. If you compare it to the military or something, it's not a lot, but um, you know, they do want to fix the problem. Uh, there is no solution to fixing brain damage at present. Um, so, the approach that we're thinking of is uh, tissue replacement. Uh, I mentioned, you know, that there is um, a lot of really good evidence that new neurons can integrate into the adult brain. Uh, we've reproduced that as well, but it's not functional yet because they're missing um, certain things. So the tissue that's put in is often much too simple in its cell type composition and missing essential cell types or not at the right ratios. Um, most of the time, the cells that are put in, the vast majority of them die because they're missing you know, cells that are important for their survival, like vascular endothelial cells that form vessels that feed them. So without those cells, the majority of these uh, transplanted cells will die. And that's a big problem if you're worried about the architecture of the cells which is also essential for their function. So the, the cortex has a very um, you know, specific layered structure that is important for the wiring and the function of that tissue. Uh, so you need all these things uh, in order to get development of new functional tissue in the adult. So how are we doing this? Well, we're not reinventing the wheel. We know it's been done already. Everybody's brains was not made by a scientist or engineer. It was made the natural way by developing from an early uh, fetal precursor tissue. And so that's what we're reverse engineering. That's a very tractable uh, approach. Here's a cartoon of that tissue. Uh, it's not the only approach. Again, in this talk I gave recently at the Foresight, I, I uh, present a couple of alternatives. Uh, but this is the approach uh, that we're taking, so I'm telling you about it now. Um, so. We've managed to make a proto-tissue that imitates this. Um, so this is, again, that cartoon of a early fetal neocortex. This is a view from the top. Um, so there's a highly vascularized layer on top, uh, which we've managed to reproduce in culture. And from the uh, bottom, um, these precursors, these are the sort of like the neuronal stem cells. They really know, need to know which way is up and which way is down in order to develop that nicely layered, mature structure. And um, so we use a marker here uh, to show that they are, in fact, they know which way is up and which way is down. That's what this green shows here. It's a sort of a uh, cobblestone pattern of, of depositing this molecule between them. Uh, for those of you who maybe like Pal, this is ZO1 labeling the tight junctions on the apical surface of the uh, tissue here. So uh, these cells really know uh, which way is up. Um, and so we're starting to test this in vivo now. Um, but previously, without having the structured tissue, as I mentioned, like a lot of people did, uh, you can put in these cells and, uh, or tissues or even organoids and show that the neurons integrate. So we wanted a platform where we could test our proto-tissue by creating a space for it. So that's what we do in the mouse. 
Um, and then we put in our cells uh, with uh, their surrounding extracellular uh, sort of matrix. Um, and again, as others have shown, uh, yeah, sorry, this thing, uh, the formatting is a little different on this version of PowerPoint, but essentially, uh, if we put those graphs in the visual cortex, over time we find that they mature just like normal visual cortical neurons and start responding to light. So uh, you can, here's the onset of light stimulation, and early on the cells are too immature and haven't integrated yet, but over time they integrate very well. Uh, we're not the first to show this. We're, I think, the fourth lab to show something like this, um, but it's, it's highly reproducible. Uh, also, I mentioned the importance of vascularization to keep the tissue alive, so uh, we, we can include the vascular endothelial cells in our tissue, as I've shown you in the proto-tissue. Here, they were just mixed in everywhere, but they quickly form vessels uh, and fuse with the host, and we have movies showing that, you know, th their circulation through those vessels in the graph. So um, that's another important aspect that uh, I think is very achievable. Uh, from the business side, I just, you know, in case there's any investors out there, um, <laughs> there's, you know, also um, good reason to be very optimistic about this type of approach moving forward. Uh, Blue Rock, uh, so if we just focus on Parkinson's, for example, there's some very successful companies. Uh, Blue Rock, most notably, uh, has effective therapies for Parkinson's, different part of the brain where they're putting in dopaminergic precursors, uh, they were bought by Bayer for about a billion dollars, uh, again, because even before they uh, showed their clinical success, uh, they generated a lot of interest because they were doing it really well, um, and, and everybody expected them to do, that it would work, uh, and, and it did, um, so good for them. Uh, Aspen Neuroscience is doing the same thing. Uh, they've been fast-tracked by the FDA as well. So again, you know, good government support for this. Um, and yeah, so, and there's, you know, other examples as well that are coming out, like uh, for epilepsy, for example, cell-based therapy, uh, where these companies seem to be doing very well. There's a lot more failures than there are successes. But again, they're not, you know, I think some of the failures were predictable in how they were approaching the problem and putting in mesenchymal stem cells, for example, in the brain where they don't belong. Uh, and not seeing anything, uh, no surprise. But if you do it right, you know, cell therapies can be very effective, and tissue therapies even more. Um, so we have, again, sorry for the formatting, uh, we have a path uh, to the clinic as well. Uh, after much diligence, uh, we're gonna go after stroke as a first indication, and then, um, you know, expand that to maybe local forms of dementia, like frontotemporal dementia, before tackling our main goal, which is just cognitive decline and aging, uh, um, which we'll do once we prove that our tissue can encode functional information and be useful to patients. So just, yeah, timeline here. Sorry, this is a bit of a pitch, but <laughs> um, yeah, so, you know, we, we're, Developing the prototype tissue, uh, testing it preclinically, making sure we can pass regulatory standards with the quality of the tissue. Again, we've done extensive diligence that we should be able to do that, even though it's costly. Uh, and then, uh, you know, go for an IND fi uh, filing and then, um, you know, do our first uh, clinical proof of concept. You know, following in the footsteps of the previous companies that I, I just mentioned. Uh, this is our scientific team. Um, thanks to them, I won't go over, but they were specifically selected for their expertises to be able to do uh, what we're doing. And I think that's it. Thanks.